And tonight's subject, the founding father of popular detective fiction, still seems to define what a sleuth, real or imaginary, is. I'm standing outside 221B Baker Street, where Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson solved cases as famous as the Red-Headed League or as obscure as the Great Rat of Sumatra, for which, as he told his devoted assistant, the world is not yet ready. Here he smoked strong shag tobacco and diverted himself with cocaine in 7.5% solution. Here he played the violin and waited for Charles Augustus Milverton, the blackmailer, the worst man in London. Here he is in his Inverness cape, off on another adventure. Here he is solving crimes that baffled the police force, called in by governments when the task can be entrusted to no one else. Here he is, a dab hand at ciphers and codes. He's written a monograph on different types of cigar ash. He has no romantic attachments, but is every inch the gentleman. Every little trick and foible of his, from his Stradivarius to his passion for disguise or handsome cabs, seems to us to be irretrievably real. He is a friend, or at least a close acquaintance, always looking the same, even dressed in a way that is comfortingly recognisable. Except, of course, he isn't. He is, as everyone knows, a fictional character created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He didn't even wear a deerstalker or an Inverness cape. Those were supplied by Sidney Paget, the illustrator of the stories. But it's hard now to think of him without them. So real does this entirely fictional detective seem to so many people that this reproduction of his headquarters at the Sherlock Holmes Museum is only one of many. People need Sherlock Holmes to be real. They write to him here at 221B Baker Street from all over the world, and their letters are answered. Not, however, by the person of whom they are dreaming, for nothing in the case of Sherlock Holmes is ever quite what it seems. to Sherlock Holmes, Abbey National PLC, you've got your name right, here's one that looks like from India, and this is to Sherlock, Abbey National PLC, Abbey House. So they all know, how do they know that this is the right place to send it to? I think it's just reputation to be honest with oh, you, right. and word of mouth. So Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> consulting detective. Dear colleague, I hope this letter finds you well. It is with deep admiration my request to pen. I hope to seek your cooperation in my desperate need to solicit your help and advise. This is the Worth Police Department, Worth, Illinois. This department which I am employed is faced with an unsolved death investigation. Consultation is urgently requested. He's a sort of great English institution, really. Mm, absolutely. Um, and that we've used to our advantage in, in as an example, our treasury operation. Um, recently went, ran an advertising ca campaign in Japan, which was probably our most successful campaign overseas. <laughs> He's instantly recognised. You simply need the silhouette with the pipe and the deerstalker hat, and people instinctively know who it is. Arthur Conan Doyle's original plan was to put Holmes in 21B, which is at the south end of Baker Street. The reason he changed the number was that 21B at the time was a private house with real people living in it. If one looks at other addresses that Conan Doyle used, he invariably exaggerated the number so that it wouldn't actually be somebody's house. But in the 1920s, London was being renumbered, and by 1930, the whole of Baker Street, York Place, and Upper Baker Street had all been joined together, and they made a two-to-one Baker Street. But it has always fascinated people. There is such a sense of reality that Sherlock Holmes lived at Baker Street that 
even people, when they were in Baker Street, they used to wonder, where did Sherlock Holmes live? Make of it, Watson. The fellow came to see you. Ah, but what kind of a fellow? Let me hear you reconstruct him from his walking stick by our usual method of elementary observation. Well, I should say that Dr. Mortimer is a successful man. Well esteemed. Good. Excellent. I should say that he does a great deal of his visiting on foot because the iron ferrule is, is worn down. Perfectly sound. <laughs> Let's have a look at this inscription. From his friends of the CCH. CCH. I should say that's for something or other hunt. Really, Watson, you've excelled yourself. <laughs> Has anything escaped me? Almost <laughs> everything, my dear fellow. Huh? A present to a doctor, I'd say, is more likely to come from a hospital than a hunt. And when the letters CC are placed before the hospital, the name Charing Cross Hospital rather obviously presents itself. I thought of a hundred little dodges, as you may say. A hundred little touches by which he could build up his conclusions, and then I began to write stories on those lines. It's hard to imagine that this smartly dressed gent is anything other than a pillar of the establishment, a man born into the ruling classes, a bluff character whose idea of tortuous complexity is an unusual cocktail. decide if a person is what they pretend to be? How do you find out if somebody is lying or if they're telling the truth? What, after you've stripped away poses, disguises, attitudes, is the essence of an individual? The man who created Sherlock Holmes had an education that uniquely qualified him for being interested in puzzles and puzzle solving. Arthur Conan Doyle was a Catholic and he was educated here at Stonyhurst in Lancashire by the Jesuits, an order whose very name has become synonymous with subtle intellectual debate and whose long history of persecution by the English Reformed Church has made them acutely aware of the need for trickery, disguise. Stonyhurst was a school that awarded scholarships to religious boys who might eventually become priests. They had great hopes of Doyle. But, as Doyle said later, it was here that he started to require evidence for his faith. Bread and wine, to him, was just bread and wine. Surprisingly, the school conspired to let him serve communion without taking it. They knew that even if he'd rejected their version of it, he was still very serious about religion. The boys here at Stonyhurst are grouped according to years, and the names of those years, figures, elements, syntax, and so on, are derived from medieval rhetoric. There's a case to be made for saying that Holmes's logic derives as much from the scholasticism of Aquinas as it does from the scientific spirit of some 19th century thinking machine. As late as 1907, Doyle tells us that one of the volumes in his collection is The Jesuits in Canada. This school made an indelible impression on him. Oh, a very strong influence. And I think that can be d uh, demonstrated by his most famous story, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Um, remember that Stonyhurst is one of the most isolated schools in the country. And um, the story of Baskerville Hall is the story of a house in isolation in the West Country. But think of Stonyhurst utterly remote, mm. uh, shrouded by mist and rain in the winter. Mm. And at the period when um, uh, he was here, we had uh, some men called the Gentlemen Philosophers, who were young men who came here to sit the university examinations of London University. 
which they weren't they weren't allowed at that point to go to go for Oxford and Cambridge because no. of the legislation. No, they were prohibited from doing so, and uh, they could keep their dogs and horses here. Well, the dogs uh, were kept in kennels over the way next to the mill, and they were. Where was be, that over back back that, in the? That was over beyond the the travel over there. And it meant that if you were sleeping in the school at yeah. night, you'd hear the dogs baying. So what do you think uh his Catholicism and his, his time at Stonyhurst gave him in the, in the creation of Sherlock Holmes. Do you think there's a relation between the two? Well, strangely enough, it gave him Moriarty. <laughs> <laughs> but he's an arch villain, the <laughs> yes, devil. Uh, yes, uh, in fact, what a Moriarty, the two Moriarty's, one, the, the famous one who became uh, Justice Darland, um, he was a, he was a, I think he was either just above or just below, below Doyle. Oh, there was a boy called Moriarty in there the were school? There yes. In fact, now, this is unfortunate. We have a photograph in which Moriarty occurs, but only the names on the back. So we can't tell out of the, for which of these boys was Moriarty. But there was a Moriarty. Stonyhurst was a very exceptional school in that you didn't really get m much holidays, did you? No, he got very little. He got six, we six weeks as at Christmas. And there is fair evidence that was on the request of his mother. He, she wanted him kept here. Yeah. She didn't want him at home. No. A bit of a mystery. No, she didn't want him with his father. Doyle's father, Charles, was an artist and designer with a feeling for fantasy. This is the fountain he designed for Queen Victoria at Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh. It's an important commission and should have been the beginning of a successful career. But Charles Altamount Doyle threw it all away. One of the things he didn't give his son was an easy, secure childhood. He started out life here at Sheens Hill Place in Edinburgh, number three, top floor flat. One of ten children, only seven of whom reached maturity. Charles Doyle was alcoholic epileptic, and as far as we can tell, occasionally violent. There's no mention of this in Doyle's autobiography, but the stories are full of it. When Holmes deduces that Watson's brother died of drink, the normally imperturbable Watson is violently angry. This is unworthy of you, Holmes. I could not have believed that you would descend to this. You have made inquiries into the history of my unfortunate brother, and you now pretend to deduce from this knowledge in some fanciful way. You cannot expect me to believe you have read this from an old watch. It is unkind, and to speak plainly, has a touch of charlatanism in it. Holmes's keenness on the Victorian equivalent of the martial arts, from single-stick fighting through something called baritsu wrestling, on which Sherlockians have written monographs, comes like the haunting images of drunkenness and violence, not from the pages of a penny dreadful, but from the author's own experience. He grew up in a rough neighbourhood. In that yard there, Doyle blackened the eye of Eddie Tullock, a neighbour's boy. The boy who lived here already knew too much about violence. Do you know, Watson, you look at these scattered houses and you are impressed by their beauty. I look at them. And the only thought which comes to me is a feeling of their isolation, 
and of the impunity with which crime may be committed. Good heavens! Who would associate crime with these dear old homesteads? They always fill me with a certain horror. It is my belief, Watson, founded upon my experience. That the lowest and vilest alleys in London do not present a more dreadful record of sin than does the smiling and beautiful countryside. That's classic Sherlock Holmes, prose with the flourish of Dracula's cape, dangerously and satisfyingly close to self-parody. It comes from a story called The Copper Beaches, the plot of which was suggested to Doyle by his mother. It's a weird piece about a young woman who's paid money by a sinister couple simply to have her hair styled in a certain way and to sit in a window for a specified period of each day. But the authentic atmosphere of evil in the story almost certainly comes from Mary Doyle's own tragic marriage. This is where the family moved after that rather down-at-heel flat in Sheens Hill Place, going up in the world. But it wasn't as simple as that. Around this time, Charles Doyle, Arthur's father, was committed to an asylum for the insane. As far as we know, two people were involved in the decision to put him there. One of them was Conan Doyle. The other, a mysterious individual called Brian Charles Waller. He was the man who paid the rent on this house in George Square, Edinburgh. The face of the house is smiling respectable. But the story behind it suggests horrors of which Sherlock Holmes' creator never spoke. Charles Doyle's committal remained a well-guarded secret until 1978 and until a contemporary scholar detective got to work on him no one had any idea of the mysterious affair of Brian Charles Waller. Apparently Charles Ultimate Doyle seems to have got jealous of the relations between Brian Charles Waller and Conan Doyle's overworked, exhausted, multi-child producing mother, Mary. And she does seem to have been quite attached to Brian Charles Waller and he gave her a cottage on his estate where she lived for many years. Now, Waller's interest may actually have been in Conan Doyle's elder sister who went off to be a governess in Portugal. She did, Annette, she did not in fact marry him and she may not have particularly liked him. It may have been that there was a relationship between Waller and the mother. But the story of the cardboard box, which turns on um, a drunken uh, sailor who ultimately murders his wife and her lover, appeared in the Strand magazine, but was suppressed when Conan Doyle was bringing out the memoirs. Charles Altamont Doyle had died within the few months separating the appearance of the story and the appearance of the book form. I think that that's very much related, that that was one thing based on what had happened. You see, Conan Doyle is writing these stories at full tilt. He's not saying, I'm going to put Daddy in this looking ridiculous. He pushes the first thing that comes into his mind. But so often it's the tragedy of Daddy. What has confused many people about Doyle is the extraordinary gap between the public and private faces of this very complicated man. My dear Watson, life is infinitely stranger than anything which the mind of man could invent. We would not dare to conceive of the things that are mere commonplaces of existence. Depend upon it. There is nothing so unnatural as that which seems most ordinary. And there is nothing so deceptive as the obvious. Doyle did leave us one almost suspiciously obvious clue as to the real original of Sherlock Holmes. It's always difficult to trace the origins of a fictional character, but if the idea for Sherlock Holmes started anywhere, it was probably here, at the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh. 
After leaving Stonyhurst, Doyle read medicine at Edinburgh University, where, for a short while, he was the outpatient's clerk to the then professor of surgery, Dr. Joseph Bell. When he was the clerk uh, to Joseph Bell, the surgeon, um, Bell, holding his clinic, is trying to intimidate the patients, not so much put them at their ease as put them at their disease. And a patient, for instance, uh, comes in, Bell looks at him and says, did you have a pleasant walk across Brunsfield Links today? And the patient looks at the management, and after the patient has gone, you see, thinking obviously the doctor is a superb witch doctor or something, um, then uh, Bell turns to Colin Doyle and asks, did you not see, Doyle, uh, that there was gravel, reddish gravel, attached to the instep? Oh, that is to be found in Brunsfield Links and nowhere else in the neighborhood. Now, of course, you can do that kind of thing in a very small area. You can't do it the way Sherlock Holmes did it. Observation tells me, Watson, that you visited Wigmore Street Post Office this morning. There is a reddish gravel which has been thrown up where they have taken up the road outside Wigmore Street, which is nowhere else to be found in the neighborhood. And supposedly, Sherlock Holmes could tell what part of London any stains on Watson's coat had come from. That's simply taking the achievement of Bell in Edinburgh over a small area, unraveling it like an enormous magic carpet or something which spreads to many times its size, and the reader in London suddenly feels London is controllable. Somebody knows what's going on here, even to the minutest details. This is a terrifying place, but one where we can find a guide in whom we have confidence and belief. There were certain qualities Bell had. He had taught his students that in medicine, observation is all important. In order to understand an illness, you have to be able to see the signs of it in a person. And you can, I can demonstrate this, Bell would say, by uh, looking at the signs on a person's uh, clothing, which shows their profession. And he had various things to raise the, the students' powers of observation. A classic one was to uh, put some acid on the table, uh, put his finger into it, and then put it into his mouth, and ask people to do the same. What they didn't notice was he put one finger in and then he used the other finger in his mouth and they just hadn't observed. He said, well, you've got to start observing. When a doctor goes wrong, he is the first of criminals. He has nerve and he has knowledge. Look at Palmer. Palmer and Pritchard were among the heads of their profession. There's some degree of shifting dollars. Okay. You could also get into. What was someone oh, done to the patient? He's had a tap, a drain. Okay, so somebody's stuck a needle in the side there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some bruising round about right. there. Okay. This is the kind of picture that uh, Professor Joseph Bell would have used to teach his students. The man's back is arched because he's going to die from untreatable tetanus. 19th century medicine was a grisly business, and there's a lot of it in the Holmes character and the Holmes stories. When Watson first meets Holmes, the great detective is beating a corpse with a cudgel to try and work out whether a cadaver can bruise after death. That wasn't something Bell did, it was another of Doyle's teachers who used to do that, but the medical influence in these stories is very strong. instruments. You know, Watson, the instruments that save life are hardly more pleasant to look at than those that take it. Hmm. Grizzly thought, Holmes. These are ophthalmic instruments of the kind used even a hundred years ago to operate on the eye to uh, remove cataracts. Mm -hmm. They're made by a company, Weiss & Company, and these manufacturers still make similar instruments today. Conan Doyle brought Weiss & Company into his famous story, Silver Blaze. Holmes and Watson were called down from London to investigate the unexplained death of a horse race trainer. It was thought that the trainer had been murdered by a rival racing group. 
In fact, when Holmes investigated the case, the cause of death was found to be uh, a horse's hoof. The trainer had, um, with ill intent, tried to disable the horse by cutting one of its uh, ligaments. And to do this, he used a ophthalmic knife made by Wieson Company. And uh, there's some significance in the fact that it was a knife he used in ophthalmology, isn't there? Yes, of course there is, because uh, Conan Doyle was training, or had trained, as an ophthalmologist, although, as we're all aware, when he went into practice, he was conspicuously... Well, sometimes you get a pulling jockey, I will say that. And sometimes... by sure of more subtle. This singular knife, which was found in the dead man's hand, and which no sane man would use as a weapon, right? No, yes, only when he used it in the most delicate operations. It was used for a very delicate operation, that knife. Excuse me. As you know, Colonel, with your wide knowledge of turf matters, that it is possible to make a slight nick in the horse's tendon and do it subcutaneously. Any slight lameness will be put down a strain in training or a bruise, never foul play. Still a damn scoundrel. Hmm. Not an operation to be done in the stable, no food. So sensitive a creature would arouse the soundest of sleepers. I've been blind, and Gregory too. Of course, that's why he needed the candle and uh, struck the match. When I examined Straker's belongings, I was fortunate to discover... Not only the method of the crime, but also the motive. Most men do not carry other people's bills in their pockets. From this I concluded that Straker was leading a double life. The nature of the bill shows that there was a woman in the case. Doyle could not afford to buy into a practice, so he set up on his own as a doctor at Bush Villas in Southsea, near Portsmouth, in 1882. He was already a published writer. But when his practice failed to take off, Sherlock Holmes came to the rescue. The first story was sold to Beaton's Christmas Annual in 1887. Its name, A Study in Scarlet. Dr. Watson, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, said Stamford, introducing us. How are you? He said cordially, gripping my hand with a strength which I should hardly have given him credit. You have been in Afghanistan, I perceive. How on earth did you know that? I asked in astonishment. <laughs> Never mind, said he, chuckling to himself. Sherlock Holmes started as Sherinford Holmes and Watson as Ormond Sacker. In the final version of the study in Scarlet, Holmes is presented as a man with a passion for scientific truth and experiment. But Doyle's own training in this area didn't seem to be enough for him. Like many people of his time, he began to take an interest in spiritualism, taking seriously the evidence and experience of the other side, a substitute for the Catholic Church. The year before he started a study in Scarlet, Doyle had met his future wife, Louise, and that relationship, like his own home life, had a gothic twist to it. He met Louise because her brother was suffering from cerebral meningitis. 
Doyle took the patient in and nursed him at his own home. The boy, he was in his early 20s, died. This is his grave. Two months later, Doyle had married his sister. From darkness into light. Sort of statement that's vague enough to go down well, even at spiritualist seances down the road in Portsmouth. A relationship that Doyle wanted to be as uncomplicated and chivalrous as Dr. Watson's attitude to his own future bride actually began in largely unacknowledged misery. There is evidence to suggest that Doyle married Louise Hawkins in the wake of a well-meant but ill-advised experiment with drug treatment on her brother. Did he marry her for love or out of guilt? For whatever reasons, Doyle was an honourable, big-hearted man. When he made a decision, he stuck to it. This was the troubled background to the birth of Sherlock Holmes. And yet, so anxious was Doyle to disclaim any seriousness in the enterprise that at the opening of Study in Scarlet, he has Watson comment on the literary origins of his partner, owning up to the fact that Sherlock Holmes has really been pinched from the pages of Doyle's favourite detective story writer, Edgar Allan Poe. Doyle had discovered Poe's infallible detective, the Chevalier Dupin, hero of the murders in the Rue Morgue. Dupin, from his crumbling mansion in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, investigates the horrible murder of two women in a miserable thoroughfare running between the Rue Richelieu and the Rue Saint-Roche. Poe is an American writer, but his evocation of the Parisian scene of the crime is eerily authentic. I'm looking for the street that gives the story its title, the Rue Morgue. Both the other streets are on the map. It must be round here somewhere. I've always known, since reading the story as a boy, that the Rue Morgue, like Baker Street, actually exists. Poe has an extraordinary feeling for place, and he sets up the locale with a kind of accuracy that makes you think you're reading an account of a murder that could have actually happened. Uh, Excusez-moi, monsieur, je cherche la rue Morgue. Je crois que c'est dans, dans l'autre rive, sur l'autre rive. Ici, on est à rive gauche et ça doit être rive droite. Mais je vais vous montrer, sur. j'ai un plan, je vais vous montrer. Ah sur oui un plan. Ça, ça existe, la, la rue Morgue Oui. Oui Je crois. Excusez-moi, pour la, la rue Morgue La rue Morgue. Morgue. Je ne la connais pas. Non P Près de la rue, rue de Seine au bout de Richelieu. Excusez-moi, pour la rue Morgue Monge. Ah, Monge. 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 M -O -N -G -E. La morgue. M -O -A. Morgue, like, like morgue and the, les cadavres. There is no such street as the Rue Morgue. It only exists in the imagination of Edgar Allan Poe. But Poe, who by the way first attained literary respectability in France, translated by Baudelaire, was a master of the hoax. He was a man who wrote an article purporting to describe the first crossing of the Atlantic by balloon and thousands of people turned out to welcome the 19th century equivalent of Richard Branson who of course never turned up. Poe's choice of Paris was no accident. Way ahead of Scotland Yard, the French led the world in the application of science to crime. Doyle was interested in their methods. These horrific images from the archives of the French police are some of the first scene of crime pictures ever taken. They date from around the time the early home stories were published in the 1890s. They're accurate records precisely to scale. The detective story deals with one of the most frightening achievements of the 19th century. The reduction of people to statistics and characters to cases. Alphonse Bertillon, the Frenchman who designed the apparatus on which I'm now sitting, 
as a way of classifying and identifying criminals, what nowadays I suppose would be called the photo fit. One said he was greatly influenced by the scientific methods of Sherlock Holmes. Although the French led the world in scientific crime detection, it was the British in Bengal in 1897 who first introduced fingerprinting on a large scale. Fingerprints went on to be the most important tool of modern crime detection. And fingerprints do crop up in the home stories. In a tale set in the place where the next and most important chapter in our author's life was due to take place. Houses like these in South Norwood in London, where Doyle moved with his wife Louise in 1891, were inhabited by the newly literate masses, the product of the Education Acts of the previous 20 years. These were the very people who were followers of Sherlock Holmes, commuters who bought copies of a new popular magazine called The Strand at railway bookstores. It was here that Doyle established himself as a professional writer. In fact, the house features in an early Holmes case called The Adventure of the Norwood Builder. He installed himself in a study, just there, on the ground floor, and between 1891 and 1893, as well as churning out historical romances, now largely forgotten, and a huge amount of journalism, he also wrote all those great early Holmes stories, the ones we fans like to read again and again, especially when we're ill. Now, like a lot of the places Doyle lived in after the success of Holmes, it's an old folks' home. But back in the 1890s, it was a prosperous suburban villa, the home of a newly successful man. And Holmes was an instant success with the public. Every time Doyle put a Holmes story in the Strand magazine, the circulation of the paper shot up by 100,000 copies. And Doyle, who was a practical man about money, bought shares in the paper. The average circulation, I think, was about 200,000, rising 250,000. But the name of Sherlock Holmes spread very rapidly. And people always say that the very first story, which appeared in Beaton's Christmas Annual, kind of faded without notice. But it was actually extremely well reviewed. And, and to those who read it, of course, the, the magic of Sherlock Holmes was there. But it was a Strand magazine that gave it a uh, high, very high profile, which he never lost. In 1893, only four years after his first appearance, Doyle decided to kill Holmes off. That year, his wife Louise was diagnosed as having TB, then a fatal condition. She was advised to take the cure in Switzerland. It was while he was there that Doyle planned how to put an end to his great detective. As every schoolboy knows, Holmes fell into the Reichenbach Falls after a struggle with the evil Professor Moriarty. The public were not pleased. They wore black armbands in the street. This is Undershaw, the house he built for Louise in 1897. It had tennis courts, a garage, its own electrical generating system, all the trappings of popular success. And, a thousand feet up here in the Surrey Hills, people said it had the climate of Switzerland. At this now forgotten home, even the writing shed has survived. It was here that Doyle once again tried to find the voice that would win him serious literary recognition. All his life, in fact, he'd valued his historical novels far more than the home stories. Holmes staged a comeback in 1903. An American magazine offered Doyle the staggering sum of $25,000 for six stories about the great detective. But there was a catch. They couldn't be retrospective. Holmes had to literally come back to life. Hence that wonderful piece of nonsense, The Adventure of the Empty House, in which Sherlock tells dear credulous Watson that he escaped from Moriarty using rare Japanese unarmed combat techniques, swarmed up the cliff to elude his pursuers, and spent the intervening time wandering around the world, winding up in, of course, Tibet with 
of course, the Dalai Lama. Are you sure you are really fit to discuss things? I've given you a serious shock by my unnecessarily dramatic reappearance. I am all right, but indeed, Holmes, I can hardly believe my eyes. Good heavens, to think that you, you of all men, should be standing in my study. Doyle's fantasy life was sensationally rich. He lived in a world of strong, noble men and beautiful, chaste women. I'm standing in front of some of the stained glass windows he put up here at Undershaw, a tribute, I suppose, to his mother's obsession with medieval heraldry and the distinguished origins of her own family. But there's evidence to suggest things were a little more complicated than that. Louise, his first wife, died in 1906, but while he was still living with her in this house, he met and fell in love with a young woman called Jean Leckie. Doyle liked to present this affair as a matter of base impulses proudly suppressed, but it may well have been a little bit more complicated than that, and until we've had access to all his correspondence, we won't know the answer. The fact is that his later years are really the story of a man backed into a corner by his own celebrity known against his will as the man who created Sherlock Holmes, he embarked on a public career as gothic as anything in the experience of his great detective. This may look like a cathedral, but in fact, I'm in the Royal Courts of Justice, just off the Strand. How do you tell if a person is what they pretend to be? How do you find out if someone is lying or if they're telling the truth? What, after you've stripped away poses, disguises, attitudes, locations, is the essence of an individual? It was P.G. Woodhouse who pointed out that Conan Doyle actually said things like, Aha! There is villainy afoot. Did he talk like Sherlock Holmes, or did Sherlock Holmes talk like him? There's no doubt that, towards the end of his life, he started to sound more and more like his own creation. In 1906, he played the detective for real in the Idalji case. Idalji was a young man of Parsi origin who'd been accused of the bizarre offence of disemboweling ponies. Doyle was able to show that not only was he too physically slight to have done such a thing, he was also severely myopic and couldn't possibly have found his way across a dark field to commit the unspeakable offence. You name the cause, Doyle signed up for it. Home rule for Ireland, he was against it. The Boer War, he was for it. Divorce law reform, well, Doyle was no feminist. His passion for all these causes was genuine and one of the most attractive things about him. But he threw himself into them with a theatrical intensity. Barristers, policemen, soldiers, they all have their uniforms. Doyle had one for almost every day of the week. And some of them he designed himself. Clothing his fantasies in reality was a fundamental need for Doyle. He publicly announced his conversion to spiritualism in 1916. This tragically touched up photograph contains a portrait of his son who died of influenza just after the end of the first war. In this very early footage of a seance, the woman sitting second from the right is Doyle's second wife, Jean Leckie. Brothers, we have met today to give the true meaning of this cooperation of the two worlds. It is not a matter of faith, but of fact. It is not only a matter of belief, but it is of knowledge. He was keen to keep up with the spirit world using all the latest technology. Although, as we shall see from this next clip, the sound system wasn't always up to scratch. 
there must be standards and readiness with all nations. In the time that is to come, a national life must cease. There must be that strength. I'm at a seance conducted by the British Reformed Spiritualist Association in West London. Over there, sitting at the head of the table, is a medium called John Sales. He claims to have regular conversations with the late Sir Arthur. Conan Doyle once said there would be whiskey and cigars on the other side, but it's almost too easy to mock the faith that sustained him after the death of his son. The eccentricity is part of his magic as a writer. Doyle was one of those rare, marvellous authors who could believe six impossible things before breakfast. And what I love about his work is its unashamed trickery, the feeling that you're never quite sure how to take all this. There is, as it happens, no such organisation as the British Reformed Spiritualist Association, and if there is a medium called John Sales, then I am not intended to be him. Disguise. Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle are all about disguise. Is it really you? <laughs> Holmes! How are you, my dear fellow? A fine detective. Can it indeed be that you are alive? Is it possible that you succeeded in climbing out of that awful abyss? <laughs> Sherlock Holmes once said that it is one of the first qualities of a criminal investigator that he should be able to see through a disguise. But if we've cheated you, it was simply to illustrate the fact that though we may think the detective story is about logical thought, in fact, as Conan Doyle knew all too well, the cards are all in the narrator's hands. People ask me, will I write any more Sherlock Holmes stories? I, I certainly don't think it's at all probable. But as I grow older, the psychic uh, subject always grows in intensity, and then one becomes more earnest upon it. And I should think that my few remaining years will probably be devoted much more in that direction than in the direction of literature. Doyle died on the 7th of July, 1930, here at Crowborough in Sussex. True to his spiritualist beliefs, there was no mourning. In fact, three days after he died, they gave a garden party to celebrate his crossing over to the other side. He was buried in the garden, a bit like the family budgie. Later on, his family kept in touch, as they say in spiritualist circles. In fact, he had conversations with a surprisingly large number of people after he died, including the well-known psychic Hannon Swaffer, of whom it was famously written, Now that Sir Arthur's had the run of all the pleasures space can offer, can we conclude they're not much fun since he comes back to talk to Swaffer? But in the 50s, when this house was sold, they dug him up. And this is where he ended up in the village churchyard at Minstead in the New Forest. In fiction and spiritualism, people come back to life to order. Holmes not only survived, he outlived and outlasted his creator. He was to be a hard act to follow. <laughs> 